You know, the reason is because we have 54 parashiot in the Torah. But according to the Jewish calendar, you know, there is only uh, 354 days, most of the years. And then many times you have holidays coming that you read the parish of the holidays. So you don't have 54 weeks in a year. So in order to finish the Torah within a year, many times we combine two of the portions of the Torah together so that that we finish it in one year. But we start after Simcha Torah and we finish it on Simcha Torah. So this week's parasha actually is a double portion called Vayakel Pekude. Now what happens is when it says Moshe Rabbeinu gathered all the Jews and he gave them a few commandments, this happened a day after Yom Kippur. Uh, to say a little bit of you know history that happened, you know we received the Torah on Shavuot, the Ten Commandments. Forty days later, we went to last week's parasha. The Jews make the golden calf, right? So Moshe has to go another eighty days on the mountain, forty days to ask for forgiveness. Another forty days he goes up there to ask God to give the second tablets, and he's successful to do that. He comes down on Yom Kippur. That's why Yom Kippur is a day of forgiveness. Because that's the day that God actually forgave the Jews very happily. So the Torah says he gathers them a day after Yom Kippur. And look what kind of commandments God gives us. The first commandment that he gives them is, Sheshet yamim Work shall be done in six days. Clear, guys? He says work shall be done for six days. On the seventh day you shall rest. And then he gives them the commandments of building the... Gives them the commandment to build the holy temple. Now let me ask you guys, where did, when did we get the commandment of Shabbat? When did God tell us to keep Shabbat? Should you guys know that? No, no, no. I'm saying in the in history. It's part of the Ten Commandments, right? The fourth one is keep Shabbat. So when did God give it to us? On Shavuot, on Mount Sinai, right? So now this is 80 days later, actually 120 days later. So Moshe, before he commands them to make the temple... As a sign that God forgave them, he gives them the commandments of Shabbat. What for? He really told them to keep Shabbat. So the traditional answer is the keeping of Shabbat is so important that actually they cannot use Shabbat, they can't work on Shabbat to even build the temple. That's why he says even though making of the temple is very important, God is going to come down amongst the Jews. But again, you, you have to keep Shabbat. That's a simple answer. But the question that we have on that, hopefully we're going to get to the very interesting in the point. Why does he say seven, six days work shall be done and then rest on Shabbat? If you want to teach them that he cannot work on Shabbat to even build a temple, just say keep Shabbat. Why six days work shall be done? You get the question, guys? What after them have to work six days a week? It doesn't make sense. Of course I don't have to work six days a week. So is the question clear? Right? Why talk about you know keeping the working the six days? So actually, one of the answers that are given is Moshe is not telling us to work six days, and he's not telling us to keep Shabbat. He's actually teaching us how to prepare for Shabbat. That's what we're going to learn tonight. I hope it's going to be very exciting. So let's go through it. Uh, anybody speak Hebrew here? A lot of guys do, right? Okay. How do you say do work? You should work. What's the word? For if you say asiya, if you say taase, right? What does te'ase mean? No, no, not te'ase. Te'ase means do. What's te'ase? Sheshet yamim te'ase melacha. Six days. Work shall be done. Doesn't say you should do the work. It seems like that work is done by itself. Work is not done by itself. Maybe today you understand that a little bit. You have these, uh, what do you call it? The robots that even deliver the food. The work is done by itself. But I mean, normally it's not that way. You got to do the work. What does the Torah say work shall be done for six days? So you see, we learn something very, very important. You see, what happens is there is two ways to work. Sometimes somebody works so hard that his entire thought is in the work. Not only when he's in business. Even after he comes home, he's thinking about his business, right? He comes home and his wife says hello to him. He's still thinking about a business. The, father, the child comes and he says, oh, daddy, I'm so happy you're home. I have no time for you. I have to think about my business. Right? So over there, this is like you do the work. You're so much engulfed or let's say drowned in the work that actually takes your entire day. Not only that, whatever a person thinks about, that's what he dreams at night. So he dreams about his work at night too. There's actually a videotape that H.com made. 
It says there was one time a guy that was a lawyer. You're like maybe three minute clip, very small clip. He comes home and the child says, Daddy, I want to talk to you. He calls him at his work. So he says, no, no, I'm working. Wait till I come home. Then I'm going to talk to you. So the father comes home and the child says, Daddy, I want to talk to you. He says, I can't talk to you now. But he says, you out of your work. I've got to do paperwork. Every time he wanted to talk to his father, his father had no time. So finally, the child comes and says, Daddy, tell me, how much do you charge your clients per hour? So again, I don't know when this video was made. It says $90 per hour. I don't, I don't think lawyers charge you $90 per hour. Probably it's like $1,000 not per hour. I remember in the 90s, it was $300 per hour. One fax was 35 bucks. Fax, two seconds, you know. That's how much it was. It does make, it's very expensive. So the guy says, well, I charge $90 per hour. So the kid goes to a sumo and he brings a charity box. And he says, Daddy, this is $45 in here. Can you give me half an hour of your time? And that's end of the video. So you see, from there, this guy was so much involved in his work that he had no time for his children. So this is a type of working. We do so much work that we are so much involved in this that it takes our whole heart and mind. Nothing else can fill it up, not even our wife, our husband, or our children. This is a type of tacit. To us, it means work shall be done. When the Torah says work shall be done for, you know, six days, it means we are not that much involved. So it's as if the work is being done by itself. What it means is you actually work only with your physical body, with your hands and feet. Of course, you have to use your brains to make some money too. But you only do it during work. When you come back home, your family is the main thing. When you come home, you know, prayers, I'm obviously your family is first. But I'm saying, you don't think about the business anymore. I did it. I, made, I, I did it to make money. Whatever the rest God does. But now I'm going to actually occupy my mind and heart with my family. So that's the explanation. Work shall be done. That means work is being done by itself. You're not so much occupied. And the truth is, there's actually a verse. There's a passage in Tehillim that hints to that. David HaMelech says, Yegiya kapecha ki You shall work with the toil of your hands. Yegiya means work hard, right? Yegiya kapecha, what does kapay mean? Hands. So Yegiya kapecha, work hard with your hands, and then you will eat. If you do that, Ashrecha betovlach, you're lucky and good is for you. What is that? How come it says work with your hands? What does it really mean? So the explanation is that your mind and your heart is not involved. It's only your hands, your external part. But really, your mind and heart is with God and your family. So that's what it means, work shall be done. Don't be so much into it. There was a story actually with the Rabbi Rashab. I mean, I'm just saying these stories to make it a little bit more clear. There was a guy that was into shoe business. Now listen, in Russia, you've got to make these plastic shoes. Boots, because always raining, whatever it is, snowy. So then when he came to the fifth of Abba for a blessing, he says, oh, I always saw feet in rubber shoes. I never saw somebody's head in rubber shoes. What did he mean? This guy was so much preoccupied with his business that 24-7 he was thinking about his business. So he says, your head is in the, in the rubber shoes, not your feet. So that's what David Amalek says, the toil of your hands. If only your hand is in there, right? But really your heart is in spiritual things. It's to do something good for another Jew, to do what God wants for your family, which they come first. Then you're lucky. Asherecha, you're lucky in this world. And you're lucky in the world to come. Why are you lucky in this world? You have less stress. You're not always worried. I'm going to make another dollar tomorrow. And then why is it good for you in the world to come? Because after you finish your work, if you're not so stressed about your work, you're going to have some time to do mitzvah. Seriously. Is that clear so far? That's what it means, work shall be done. Um, if you know, And the truth is, we do believe that all the blessings that we do that we get, the money that we make is a blessing of God. They were actually explaining, you have to have a business. Money doesn't grow on trees. If you sit at home, money is not going to come. Unless you're such a believer that you have no worries. But if you have worries, I'm going to make money. You got to go to work. But you have to know that the work is only a vessel. It's only a tool. Or well, the way the Lubavitch Rabbi said it, the business is a pocket. The bigger the pocket, more money can go into it. But who guarantees that money comes into your pocket? God's blessing. God's blessing. I'm, you could see it. You know, there are people, you know, they did investments, that so much things. They, they work at the end, everything goes in the air. 
And you have some guys that, you know, don't know anything. They even didn't go to college. They end up making, you know, millions of dollars at the time. There's actually a story with that. There was a Jew one time, you know, that he had a steel company. Um, this was early years when they came from Europe. How was it? So when he came, you know, if you're going back into the 30s and 40s, you couldn't keep Shabbat because they wouldn't give you a job. You had to work seven days a week. Thank God today, you know, the world is in such a way they could actually have a job and not work on Shabbat. So Jews that came from Europe, they would tell them, hey, you want to work here? You have to work seven days a week. Can you work on Shabbat? So many of them lied, yeah, we're going to work on Shabbat. So as soon as Shabbat came, they would, they would like make themselves sick. Well, I can't come to work because I'm sick. But then after a week, you know, twice you play that game, the owner knew you're a Jew, they would fire you. So there was this guy that came from Europe. He didn't want to work on Shabbat. He didn't get a job. He would go into the trash cans and find scrap metal. You know, like unfortunately what the homeless people do. They go take bottles, you know, to recycle. There was no recycling in those days. So he used to get like the scrap metal and sell it. So after a while, he made some money and he made you know, more money. And then finally, he was able to make his own company that makes steel. But then he had to expand it. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot one part of it. I'm really, really sorry. So when he couldn't find a job, he said, you know, let me go get a job in a synagogue. So he went to a synagogue and he found the job to be a shamash. A shamash is a guy that takes care of, you know, everything that has to be done in the synagogue. But there was one condition. You had to know how to read and write English. This guy just came from Europe, not from Israel. He just came from Europe. He didn't know how to read and write English. So he even didn't get that job. So that's why he had to go pick up the scrap metal. Because he couldn't even get a job in a Jewish place. So anyways, when he had to get a loan from a bank to make his uh, steel company bigger, so the, the, the president of the bank comes and he says, okay, you got to sign. The guy didn't know how to sign. He signed his name X. So the guy says, why do you sign as an X? He says, because I don't know how to sign my name. So the guy says, wow, imagine, look where you got. You got so far without knowing any English. Do you know where you would get if you know a lot of English? He says, I would be a shamash in a synagogue. That's what I would be. <laughs> because he didn't know English, he, became to be, he came out to be a millionaire. But again, you got to go to work. I'm not saying no. But we have to believe what brings the success is the blessing of God. So this is what Moshe Rabbeinu says. If somebody goes to work, has to think that it's done by itself. Meaning, all we do is, whatever, you make a little vessel, but don't put your entire mind and thing into it. That's what it says to us, right? And then after what it says, when Shabbat comes, it's going to be Shabbat Shabbaton. How come it's called a double Shabbat? Shabbat Shabbaton is like a double Shabbat. Because you see what happens is when a person is totally into his business with his head, with his heart, that even sacrifices his family, even on Shabbat he can't keep Shabbat. Because constantly thoughts of business come to his head. So even the Shabbat is not Shabbat. In his mind at least, it's a business day. But if he knows that really the blessing is from God, he's very, very calm. He knows that today he's going to make his money. No worries. Obviously, it's easier done than said. But we're going to go through actually a couple of stories that we have to believe that God actually is going to send our livelihood. So then he has no worries after he finishes his job. His Shabbat is a, is a Shabbat too. Is that clear, people? So far, it's clear? Okay. Let's go to a little bit of a uh, different uh, you know, angle of this. Um, you know, when we pray every morning, very interesting. There is a blessing, you know, in the morning when you get up, you have a bunch of blessings. One of the blessings we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you God, She'asal di kol tzarki, that he has made, that God has made or, or prepared all my needs. Right? We say this blessing when we put on our shoes. At least for his shoes. Why? A person can't go to work unless he's going to put on his shoes. So after he puts on all his clothes and he puts on his shoes, he's ready to go to work. So the blessing is that God is, has made all my needs, meaning whatever money, financial needs I'm going to have, God has prepared it for me. The problem is you said in the morning as soon as you get up, you didn't go to work yet. You didn't make your money yet. So the blessing should have been in the future. Blessed are you God who's going to make my needs. Why do you say God made my needs? You didn't make it yet. You didn't go to work. So one of the answers that they give is, Already in heaven, there is decreed you're going to make your money that day. You're not going to make a penny more than what God decided for you to make that day. So really in the spiritual world, the money is there. God already has prepared it. When you go to work, that blessing just comes down to the physical world. So your need is already made. 
you know, it's a different way of mentality. It's not the Western way of thinking. The more you work, the more money you make, right? But a Jew believes that's not the way. Of course, you got to go to work. But it's actually a blessing from God. At the beginning of the day, you go with such trust that you know it's going to be a good day. Definitely God is going to send the money to you. You're a very spiritual person. You're different. You ever thought about it that way? We didn't. I'm saying it's in really a Jewish education. Of course, you got to go to work. But God already decided how much money you're going to make that day. And you go with confidence. That's going to be a wonderful day. You're going to make the money that you need. <coughs> Clear people? Yeah. Um, so uh, <clears throat> now Moshe Rabbeinu told this to the Jewish people the day after Yom Kippur. You're going to go to a very, very honestly... Uh, very, uh, what do you call it? Very, very refined way of thinking. I don't think we've ever discussed that before. Oh, we're not going to think that I'm a fanatic. If you think I'm a fanatic, I'll stop. So let me know. Uh, you see what happens is, according to Judaism, by the way, idol worship is not if somebody denies God. What happens if you do believe in God, but you think there is other powers besides God? The other important, like, you know, you have a company, you have the manager, you have this, you have a CEO, you have the owner. Or let's say in the country, you have a president, you have a vice president, you have, I don't know, secretary of state, correct? Each one of them is an independent being, but the highest is the president. Now, what happens if I believe God, there is a God, but there is other powers that are independent from God? Would you consider that idol worship or not? That's my question. Yeah. All right. How do you know that's idol worship? Because when we pray, we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. There is only one God. There is only one God. That's why Christianity, and I'm talking about, you know, Catholics, for a Jew, that's considered to be complete idol worship. Not for them. For them, as not, because they said there's Trinity. There is God, there's that Holy Spirit, and then there's the Son, you know, we call it Yeshu, whatever they call him, Jesus, whatever they call him, right? So at any rate, you're saying that uh, he's, there's a God, there's the Spirit in the middle, the Holy Spirit, and then there's the Son. And actually they believe only through the Son you can get to God. This is Trinity for us, that's idol worship. Because every morning, every single of one of you guys, doesn't matter how observant we are, you say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Adekin, Hashem Echad. There's only one God. There's no Trinity at all. So why, why is that idol worship? The moment you say there is something independent from God, that's already idol worship. If you say Trinity is three powers, you have to say God stops here. The Holy Spirit starts here and stops here, and then the Son starts here. You're limiting God. You know what I'm saying? That's why I said there is three. That means you could divide them. So if you said there is any independent power from God, that's already considered to be idol worship. If somebody believes that I make my money has nothing to do with God is there, God could mess me up if he wants, you could you know, cause an accident, I'm going to lose my money, whatever it is. But you know what? I'm the one that makes the money. It's me as an independent being. To a certain extent, that's a little bit of idol worship. I'm sure you have heard it from your parents. If somebody just believes in making another dollar, he does anything to make another buck, right? He does even wrong things to make another dollar. He has made the dollar his God. Have you ever heard that? Anybody told you this before? Never heard it. But I mean, you talk to old generation, they always say that. If you're going to do anything just to make a dollar, you don't care how you make it. So your entire life becomes the dollar that you make. That means you make dollar like you got. So somebody also thinks that he makes the money himself, has nothing to do with God. So he thinks he's independent from God. That's a little bit of a Abu Dazara too, which means idol worship. I hope I'm not too fanatic today. Make sense? Yeah. If I'm fanatic, please let me know. You know, I went to one of these high schools. I was talking about the wrong things that, you know, this generation has, you know, changing your gender, this and that. So the next day I got a phone call from the prison rabbi. <laughs> please don't talk about these things. I'm okay with it, but a lot of kids in school don't like to hear these things. It's like I'm not talking about fanatical stuff. I'm sorry. I got a call, you know, you're in El Camino. Yeah, I know, but some people, you know, to accept the truth is very difficult. Yeah. Anyways. I was actually speaking. Do you think it's okay for a kid under 18 without the parent's consent to change his or her gender? So there were some, you know, non-Jewish kids. Of course, what's wrong with that? I said, hey, my friend, you can't even smoke. You can't even buy a cigarette without your, you know, if you're under 18. 
So how could you give to a child that is not mature enough? Anyway, so actually I got a phone call from the girl. They said, well, VIP school, same thing. He says, Rabbi, please don't talk about these things. Nobody likes to hear it. So I learned you can't become too fanatic too much. What are you saying? What? You're just like highly against it. You're destroying the kid's life. Because I'm telling you, you know, you know what it is. If you change your whatever gender, so then your body has different hormones. You have to be under medication the whole time. I don't know much, you know what I'm saying? But that's what I hear from what, you know, on the news. So basically, you're going to be dependent on some, whatever, drugs or something for your body to function. I'm not too familiar with that. But that's what they were saying, honestly. Yeah. Again, I listen more to uh, Republican conservative news. I don't know what the Democrats say because I, I just don't agree with a lot of things they say. A lot of stupid things, I'm sorry. Right. They come and say, therapists say it's very healthy for you. Cigarettes are bad for you. But if you feel that you have to be a girl, it's healthy for you. Therapists say it's very good for you to change your gender. I'm not kidding. So I, I don't want to listen to them. They even put doubts in your mind. If you're a normal person, you feel being normal is abnormal. So you have to become abnormal to feel normal. It's unfortunate. But anyway, so hopefully I'm not too fanatic today. Um, but again, remember guys, going to work, you have to know that's a blessing of God. And when you go to work, you feel so confident that today God is going to bring whatever you need. And I'm telling you, ask your parents and your grandparents. There has, there has always been situations that you think you're not going to make it. The last minute, always salvation comes. No questions. But you got to live with that faith to have it. So that's one thing that you're... Kind of like manifestation. What do you mean? Like you're manifesting it to happen. Like what you're talking about. Exactly. The faith makes it happen. It opens channels. I'm not kidding. If you really have faith in God, it opens new channels for you. So you say manifestation of real? Yeah, this, the way you, you see, the way you make yourself, if you make yourself a receptacle to God's blessing, you will get it. I'm not kidding. That's the way it is. Um, anyway, so that's one thing that I wanted to study with you this week. Guys, we're going to go to another thing that actually is connected to Passover. We've got like maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And, you know, we have a lot of things about Passover going on. Uh, let's discuss the first thing. You know, when Pesach comes, there's many names. For the holiday of Pesach, right? One thing is we call we call it Pesach, right? Correct. We call it Pesach. You know in the Torah this holiday is never called Pesach. In the Torah, it's called Chag Matzot, the holiday of Matzah. The only time the Torah uses the word Pesach, it's referring to the Pesach sacrifice that you bring it a day before Passover, and there was a commandment to eat the meat of you know Pesach sheep. At the night of Passover. So anytime the Torah says Pesach, means the sacrifice of Passover. But the holiday is called Chag Hamatzot. We don't call it Chag Hamatzot. We call it Pesach, which means Passover. Why do we call it Pesach Passover? Because God actually passed over the Jewish houses. He didn't kill the firstborn. Because in Hebrew, Pesach has two meanings. Either it means to have pity, to have mercy, or Pesach means to jump over. There's an argument amongst the commentators. So both of them make sense. Either God had mercy, didn't kill the firstborn of Jews, or God actually jumped over the Jewish houses, not killing the firstborn Jews. He only did the Egyptians that were idol worshippers. Correct? So why do we call it Passover? Are we in an argument with God? Because God calls it Matzot. I'm not going to call it Matzot. I'm going to say another name against God. What's going on? So actually, a few commentators explain. You know, there's a very, very special relationship between God and the Jewish people. Um, all you guys understand that there's a special relationship between parents and kids, right? Parents love their kids. It might make mistakes, but really it's done out of love. We just don't know how to, uh, sometimes, you know, we, we miss the right way. More than that, I'm sure, you know, many of us that all of us hopefully become from a very healthy relationship between our parents, right? There's always a very, you know, there's a, there's a love relationship between a husband and wife. So one of those love relationships are that the husband always says the good about his wife in private and in front of the children. And also the wife always says positive things about her husband in front of the kids and in private. Uh, I'm just going to you know, actually share a story with you. This is an old woman. Um, I think her last name is Sarabransky. I'm not sure. She's already a great grandma in Australia. So she says when she was a kid, she was always embarrassed to interfere 
when his her parents were in the kitchen. What did they do? After they finished eating supper, right? So the father was a big time at Chacham, a scholar. He will learn the Gemara. But he will learn the Gemara loud and translate it into the language that his wife spoke. And the wife was busy washing the dishes, no dishwashers those days. But as she was washing the dishes, she was asking questions. What does the Gemara mean? And he actually did answer back. So it says, whenever that was happening, I didn't interfere. I felt, you know, the love that's between my parents. She's, you know, washing dishes, but she loves to hear words of Torah, and he's reading it and translating it. He didn't need to translate for himself, because he spoke the Gemara language. And then he says, you know what, whenever I used to eat, right, and I would, you know, make a mess, my father would tell me, no, don't make a mess. But when I ate like a real, real girl, so my father said, you see, you look like such a good lady, like your mom, you're eating like your mother. You know what I'm saying? Indirectly, was saying how good the mother is. Whenever the father had no time to do homework with the child, he, he wouldn't say, I have no time for you to go to your mother. He said, you know, this subject is very difficult for me. Your mom is smarter in this subject. Go to your mom, she'll answer you. So that's why it says, it was amazing. You know what I'm saying? She didn't go to classes to learn how to deal with her husband. But again, because the relationship between her parents were so beautiful, right? He really did. She calls it the Jewish love. That's the article. If you go to Chabad.org, you'll find it. Right? So now coming back to our discussion, why does God call this holiday matzah? Because he wants to show the greatness of the Jewish people. Why did you guys have matzah? Why did we eat matzah on Pesach? What? Well, again, they had, let's make it better. They had no time to wait for the dough to rise. They were rushing out. Did they even ask a question? Moses, why are you telling us to leave? We're going to get food. We're going to desert. We know where we're going, you know. Nothing grows in the desert. How could we leave? Give us five days, you know, to take all the food with us. Jews never asked a question. So Matzah shows that I had full trust in God. Even though they had no idea what they're going to eat. Well, God tells us to eat. Okay, we have this dough. Make a matzah go out. So God is saying the praise of the Jews. That they had faith in me. Therefore, he says matzah. Why do we call it Pesach? Because Pesach means jumping over. We mentioned God's kindness. That he jumped over the house of the Jews and he didn't kill the firstborn. So that's one thing we learned. Jews always say the good of God. And God always says the good of the Jewish people. Clear so far? That's step number one. And Bezer Hashem, I hope I'll finish it in five minutes. That you look awesome. Yes. You looked awesome before, but you look more awesome. I, I, was, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, I mean, a Jew has to look very kingly. Yeah. Or yeah. queenly, whatever you call it. Now you look like a king. Ready to get married. Yes, sir. To a Jewish woman. Yeah, of course a Jewish girl. Only Jewish. There's nothing wrong with non-Jews, but they're not your soulmate. I prefer Jewish women. I don't <laughs> think you have a choice. Only Jewish women. I think you have a choice. You have a choice. You have, no, you have a choice. <laughs> Remember that. Nothing wrong with non-Jews. There's nothing wrong with non-Jews. Just not your soulmate. Exactly. It's detrimental to both of you if you get married. To her and to you. I want my soulmate. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So let me just guys discuss one more thing, which actually I think is very, very relevant. You see, we say that on Pesach we got freed. The third name that Passover has, Zman Cheruteinu, the time of our freedom. Now, it's a very interesting question. We're not free. You just change masters. When we were in Egypt, who was our master? Pharaoh. Now that we left, okay, we don't serve Pharaoh anymore, but you serve God. I'm sorry, God is much harsher than Pharaoh. At least by Pharaoh, you know, you work during the day at night, you went to sleep. When you're a Jew, when you get up, say Modani. The first thing you do, you got to pray. Next thing is when you eat, you got to make a blessing. When you go to bed, even if you're dead tired, just don't go to bed. You have to say the whole Shema to go to sleep. You want to get married, you can't get married to whoever you want. You want to eat, you can't eat whatever you want. Right? Then Passover comes, no chametz. Sukkah comes, you can't eat out of the sukkah. Come on. This is such a controlling God. What kind of freedom is this? I'm not free. I've got a tougher master. Maybe that's why all the Jews said want to go back to Egypt when they were in the desert. So really, how is this the holiday of freedom? I became a bigger slave. So there's two answers given. We're going to go through it. One is the simple answer. 
You see, a free person is not somebody that he does whatever he likes. A free person is someone that actually controls his, uh, his emotions. He's in the control of his emotions. To make it a little bit you know, more clear, imagine somebody's on drugs, right? When he takes the drugs, wow, he's flying in heaven. It's such a good feeling. Imagine when the drug is not there. Ever seen them shaking? They go crazy, they go nuts. So he's an addicted. He's not a free person. Somebody that actually could control not taking drugs, he's a free person. Now, what's the difference if somebody is addicted to drugs or to his evil inclination? I can't control myself. I need something, I'm going to steal it. There is no difference. There's no difference. So actually, somebody who always gives in to his passion, he is a, he's a slave. A free person is somebody that controls his passion. This is what Passover taught us. That I control my emotions. I control my passion. I'm a free person. To make it a little bit more understood, look at a homeless guy. Nothing against them. They make whatever they want. They eat whatever they want. They sleep whatever they want. I'm telling you, these days, unfortunately, you drive in the street, they just pull their pants down and they're just making the street. You want a bigger freedom than that? I mean, they're free to do whatever they want, especially with California law. You can't even put them in jail anymore. Right? That's it. They're free to do whatever they want. And then you have a CEO of a company that he can't dress any way he wants. He has to get up at a certain time. He can't just sleep till 11 o'clock in the morning. He has to go run a company. Who would you rather be? The homeless guy or the CEO? Of course. But you have so many restrictions. You have to get up at a certain time. You have to dress at a certain time because you're in control. You're a free person. But a homeless guy, I'm sorry, he has all these passions, but he's not a free person at all. That's a simple explanation. But you see, guys, let's go through a deeper explanation. Are you ready, guys, to go to a deep? And then we're going to go through to, to eat. There's a much deeper explanation. You see, freedom is actually something relative. Freedom is not absolute for everybody. Let's bring an example. Freedom for a tree, so to speak, so to speak is if he has strong roots in the ground and he's next to a river that a lot of water comes. Now, take an animal, chain him to a place that he can't walk around, put a lot of food and drink in front of him. Would that be a freedom for the animal? Of course not. Part of the freedom of an animal is that it can walk around. Even though for a tree, that's perfect. If the tree is loose in the ground, I'm sorry, it's going to die soon. It has to have strong roots attached to the ground and next to a river. But for an animal, that's no freedom. He has to be able to walk. Take an intellectual person. Give him everything he wants. No access to any books. You can't study anything. But he's an intellectual. You call him free? No. Part of his freedom is that he can actually learn something. Now let's go a step higher. Talking about a Jewish person that has a godly soul. True freedom is if his godly soul is connected to God. You know, we find many times people are not happy. So he says, you know what? If I'm going to get a Porsche, I'll be happy. So he runs, runs, and he makes all the money, buys a Porsche. I don't know if Porsche is a car anymore. Yes. No, I'm saying, but is it like something that makes you happy? You guys want to have Rolls Royce. Maybe I said, like I said, I want to have a Toyota. Toyota is cheap. What? what what's a good car these days? What's S-Class? Is it so oh, S-Class. Okay. Okay. You know, guys, I say, I say this as a joke. Please get married fast. Because the girl is going to be happy with the S-Class. If you're going to get married in 10 years, she's going to want a helicopter. <laughs> That's my joke. Why do you the joke? What? I said get married fast. Because now you could make you happy with the Mercedes. If you're going to push it off for 10 years, you can't attract the girl. Oh, okay. See, she wants a helicopter now. <laughs> yes. Anyways, may God give it to you. No, no problem. But anyways, going a little bit further, guys. Guys, going a little bit further. I don't want to be too late. So you see, for a Jew that he has part of God within him, has a godly soul, part of the freedom is to be connected to God. And I prove that to you. See, imagine, so you buy the Porsche, whatever the car was, and you feel happy. How long do you feel happy about it? Two months. Two months. After you get bored. But imagine you help a poor person. Somebody was dying. There was no food. Forever you're happy because you did something godly. Exactly. So you feel it that really something godly that you do gives you such a satisfaction that says for the rest of your life, 
All these physical pleasures. Have seven bedroom house, five story house, have the best car, you know what I'm saying? Have the most beautiful things in this physical world. After two months, you're bored. It shows that the true freedom of a Jew is to be connected to God. That's exactly why Passover is called our holiday of freedom. Before that, in Egypt, we are only involved in, you know, crazy stuff. Just physical things. But now you're going to be connected to spirituality. And you see, that's what God, that, that, that's exactly what Passover is. That you're going to get the energy from God to go higher than their physical needs and, you know, whatever, limited uh, physical pleasures. We could become godly people. Does that make sense? So two answers why it's called freedom. You control your passion or freedom of a Jew is to be connected to God. And that's what Passover gave us. Because once we left Egypt, what did God give us? His Holy Torah. That's the ultimate spirituality. Thank you for listening, everyone. It was 